first camera was an Agfa Select. It cost nine pounds, seventeen shillings and six pennies. And that of course was back in nineteen fifty nine. In those days cameras were fully manual. Shutter speeds and apertures were set by the photographer by rotating dials according to light conditions, calculated by using a separate exposure meter or by using information printed on a leaflet enclosed with the film. Even today, it could be argued that using a camera like an Agfa Select taught you real photography. Twenty years later, I purchased a Hasselblad 500CM. It cost a bit more than the Agfa, but it didn't have a built-in exposure meter, even at the higher price. These are the basic shutter speeds and apertures found on most manual cameras, and digital cameras use them too. As you move from one adjacent value to the next, the photographer is either doubling or halving the amount of light reaching the film or sensor. Some cameras had half stops, which for clarity I would disregard, but today's digital cameras provide every conceivable variation in between for greater exposure accuracy. Before purchasing the Hasselblad in 1979, Three years earlier, I upgraded my Agfa to a Nikon FE, a brilliant semi-automatic 35mm film camera, which had a built-in exposure meter. But the photographer still had to set the controls manually according to the meter readout for correct exposure. I firmly hold the opinion that this valuable experience of using manual and semi-automatic cameras gave me some understanding of what is happening inside a camera when a photograph is taken. Knowledge still important with today's computerized digital cameras that does everything for you. Or do they? Let me give you a couple of examples. When I taught photography, I had students flaunting the latest technical camera but they knew nothing about traditional photography. I was even told that this was no longer necessary as cameras did everything for you. They also expected to be an expert photographer by the end of a weekend break. Computerization in photography is a mixed blessing that often sends out the wrong message. This is the type of shot that requires photographic knowledge a long shutter speed to blur the train, and an effective image stabiliser in camera or lens, or in this case, both, as you cannot use a tripod on the London Underground. Of course, you hope that the passenger doesn't move. I wonder, you know, I wonder if this type of shot can be done with a camera on auto or with a smartphone. And by the way, I haven't blurred the train in Photoshop. Shutter speeds and apertures do more than produce a correctly exposed image. We have seen how shutter speeds blur movement. Apertures also control depth of field, that is, sharpness of an image from front to back. This is another shot that is difficult for a camera on auto or with a smartphone. Making the trees unsharp ensures that the cow parsley stands out from the background. These two images are photographs, not snaps. Returning to the basic aperture values, we have what appears to be a most unhelpful set of numbers. They have a significance that need not concern us here. In the days before automatic exposure, the photographer had to memorize these numbers in the same way that a musician learned scales. They are only one half of the bedrock of photography, and, like shutter speeds, as you move from one adjacent value to the next, the amount of light reaching the sensor is either halved or doubled. Confusingly, the highest number let in the least amount of light to the digital sensor. This is because the values are usually shown as an abbreviation. 
Look at your camera lens, and quite likely it is shown in full. In terms of jargon, the difference in exposure between two adjacent aperture values is known as a stop, and the same applies to two adjacent shutter speed values. When presenting an image exposure, the two values, shutter speed and aperture, are shown together. For this attractive image of the River Tweed in Scotland, the shutter speed determined by the camera's automatic exposure control was 1 2 of a second, the aperture f11, f incidentally being an abbreviation for factor. Prior to automatic exposure control, with a manual camera like my Alpha Select or Hasselblad, this had to be calculated with the help of a separate exposure meter. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that was all we had to do when calculating a correct exposure? Unfortunately, not. Film was available at different speeds. That is how quickly it responded to light and shown as an ISO value, which means International Organization for Standardization. Although it affects an exposure, its application should not be confused with shutter speeds or apertures. For now, I show how different ISO speeds applied to a digital sensor can alter exposure values. Like shutter speeds and apertures, adjacent ISO values either double or half the speed at which the sensor responds to light. And, in this example, as we move down the scale, the speed at which the sensor picks up light increases. The shutter speed and aperture values halved, otherwise the image will be overexposed. It is most useful in low-light situations like churches. By increasing the ISO value, the camera can be handheld with a shorter shutter speed. Most cameras have a mode dial that allow the photographer to control certain camera functions. One of the tasks I set for students wedded to auto and program was to take two shots of a waterfall, one with the water frozen, the other blurred. They soon realized that their reliance on auto or program was not going to help. Furthermore, because of their lack of photographic knowledge, they didn't even know that different shutter speeds would create different effects to a moving subject. When setting the shutter speed on shutter priority, the camera automatically finds the correct aperture. But be careful, if the shutter speed is either very short or very long, the camera cannot always compensate with a suitable aperture to avoid an under or overexposed image. Depth of field is controlled by apertures. A large aperture reduces depth of field, allowing the cow parsley, as seen here, to stand out from an unsharp background. On the other hand, a small aperture increases depth of field so that everything is sharp. As with shutter speeds, when controlling apertures on aperture priority, the camera will automatically select the right shutter speed for a correct exposure. Added to this, it should be remembered that a wide-angle lens, prime or zoom, extends depth of field at any aperture, but a telephoto does the opposite by reducing it. Knowing how to adjust apertures and selecting the right lens for the job extends our knowledge into creative photography. By using a telephoto optic and a wide aperture, sharpness of the image is restricted to the statue. The window is now out of focus, creating depth, but more importantly, because it is unsharp, the viewer's attention now shifts to the statue. 
The window is still important because it informs us that it was shot inside a church. On the other hand, a wide-angle lens and a small aperture does the opposite, rendering everything in focus. Depth of field at any aperture or lens is greatly reduced for close-ups, particularly macro where it hardly exists. I am leaving to one side focus stacking, as it requires a separate program. At f8, the plumage of the owl on the left is just going out of focus. f11 would have probably been better, provided, of course, the bird remained still, as the camera now has to compensate with a longer shutter speed. However, notice how at f5.6 more of the owl becomes unsharp, but you could argue that this is the better of the two images, as only the owl's eyes and beak are now absolutely sharp. I feel that photographs of fungi should be completely sharp, but notice how the grass in front of and behind the image is starting to go out of focus. F8, a wide-angle lens, and experience does the trick. Depth of field is not a problem if the subject is some distance away, as infinity kicks in at around 150 to 200 feet, depending on lens, beyond which everything will be sharp provided there is nothing in the foreground. If hand-holding, a shot with a telephoto lens would need a fast shutter speed to prevent camera shake. This would also be necessary if the subject was a wild animal taken on safari. Many photographers overlook exposure compensation. In addition to shutter and aperture priority, it is also available on program, but not auto. Exposure compensation reduces or increases exposure regardless of other meter settings. It is particularly useful for high contrast images where there is a danger of highlights burning out to a pure white. It is also important at night because exposure systems do not read black accurately, rendering them as a grey. Underexposing by three stops corrected the sky without affecting highlights. Furthermore, this was an unplanned shot and the reduction in exposure helped me to handhold and still achieve sharpness. You are probably using matrix metering, but there are other choices for specialist subjects, the main alternatives being centre-weighted and spot. Matrix is okay for most scenes, but not those of high contrast. Matrix metering segregates the scene, which I show diagrammatically. It meters each segment and combines the result for best exposure. Sounds perfect, doesn't it? But there are many other subjects that challenge this method. Now here's one. This is the photograph correctly exposed. But because it is of high contrast, I had to spot meter a highlight, allowing the wall to become underexposed, which can be lightened in post-production. Matrix overexposed the window, especially the reflection, and burnt-out highlights are more difficult to correct in post-production. Spot meters a small part of the image, usually the centre, but this can be changed in the camera menu. It is very unforgiving and only recommended for use with an electronic finder or camera screen having live view, as it can be previewed. In the absence of both, use center weighted as it also meters a wider area of the screen. By moving the metering point around, the photographer can select that part of the composition to meter from for correct exposure. Best done with an electronic finder. Essential for this image as it has two suns. Arriving at white balance, 
we reach a more specialist area of photography. When saving to JPEG, when white balance is set to auto, the camera will digitally process the image accordingly, but it doesn't always get it right. Think of white balance as color balance, and if your JPEG images have a color bias, the in-camera processing has not worked successfully. This can be overcome by setting white balance to the type of day, sunny, sometimes expressed as daylight, or cloudy. When saving to RAW, the photographer can correct white balance errors in post-production with programs like Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop. A RAW image is digitally unprocessed, completed afterwards in a computer, not camera, before saving to JPEG. This enables the photographer to make adjustments and corrections usually done in camera when saving direct to JPEG, and there are considerable differences. Many other adjustments, and some quite advanced, can be carried out this way in post-production. I conclude this section with a brief example of how I correct a raw image. This is the corrected image, but being of high contrast, I spot metered a highlight to avoid overexposure. This results in the rest of the image going dark, but this can be rescued in Lightroom, and here are the settings. You will find elsewhere on my channel dedicated programs about this technique. I finish by showing from start to finish three examples. Stop the program for a closer look at details, both camera and computer. I hope it makes sense. There are many other aspects of traditional and digital photography I haven't discussed, like ISO settings. Treat this program as a starter and then explore further dedicated programs on my channel, such as noise and correcting converging verticals. Auto only achieves the perfect average. I have shown what can be achieved beyond instant gratification. The choice is yours. Have fun. Thank you.